Hello, I'm Karina Lesser, Artistic Director of Scripps Presents, the public programming series at Scripps College. And I'm delighted to welcome you to a conversation with Kat Chow about her new memoir, Seeing Ghosts. Scripps Presents seeks to complement the dynamic humanities curriculum at the college by bringing the most thoughtful and timely writers, artists, and scholars into conversation with our community. Our series is also an opportunity to partner with fantastic organizations like KPCC and LAist, who are as committed as we are to creating a forum for dialogue and reflection on the most critical issues of our times. All the programming on KPCC and LAist is made possible by the generous support of its members. Thank you. And if you're not already a member and you're in a position in which you can give, you can visit online at support.kpcc.org slash in person. A few housekeeping notes. Throughout this evening's event, we invite you to engage with us and your fellow attendees in the chat. To join the chat, you should see a prompt to log in right under this video window. Just enter your name and email address to access. For questions, let us know your name and where you're joining us from. A live text transcript of the program is also available directly under the chat window. And if you want to go back and watch this event again or share with somebody who wasn't able to join us in real time, the full event video will be right here where you're watching now. You can find this page on kpcc.org slash in person. Finally, if you haven't already gotten your copy of Kat's book, you can do so at our partner bookstore, Skylight Books. And now I'm delighted to turn things over to KPCC LAS Asian American Communities Correspondent, Josie Wong. Josie. Thanks, Karina. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am so excited today to be able to welcome Kat Chow, uh, who I've always um, admired her writing for so long since her days at NPR and all her magazine pieces since. And it's been um, really uh, an honor and, uh, to read her book and be able to speak with her about her book debut. Uh, everybody say hi to Kat. Hi, all. <laughs> Um, so Kat, after reading Seeing Ghosts, I got to say thank you so much for telling the story of your family, this deeply personal story, and the loss of your mom uh, to cancer when you were just 13 and how that's shaped her life. Uh, this is uh, a book that's definitely going to, to stick with me. Um, I related a lot to it. And I know many of the folks with us today have already read the book, but for those who haven't, it's the kind of read that will just grip you because, I mean, A, the very beautiful writing, but also Kat's very direct, wry voice. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I suspect you'll recognize some aspects of your family, um, recognize your, your, your dad or mom or yourself and some of the people in uh, Kat's book. I know I did. Uh, at the same time that it's this ent very intimate personal story, this memoir, it also feel, felt very sprawling, um, in some ways um, epic to me in that it spans generations and crisscrosses the world. And I had a, got a really good sense of place uh, throughout the book, Kat, as you moved around Hartford, Connecticut, where you grew up, to Guangzhou, where you're family has its origins to Cuba, where your paternal grandfather lived and died. And, uh, you know, there's racial history interwoven seamlessly into the story of your family that uh, I, as a reader, didn't really realize that I was learning something new. Um, and Kat, throughout your book, I also noticed that you referenced the works of other writers like Ken Liu and Diana Koi Nguyen. And yes. mm -hmm. um, we talked about how It'd be great for you to kick things off by reading the part of your book where you talk about how Nguyen's uh, collection of poems helped to inform your own understanding of grief. So would you mind doing that for us? Yeah, absolutely. And I loved Diana Coy Nguyen's poems um, and her collection Ghost Of in particular and found it was so resonant. And so the section that I'm going to read tonight from Seeing Ghosts um, talks a little bit about that. When I consider the ways images can wrench our grief to the surface, I think of Diana Coy Wynn's poems, which are wrapped around photos of her family in her collection Ghost Of. The book is dedicated to her siblings, including her brother who committed suicide. He is cut from every photo. Wynn plays with these memories. She cocoons him with her grief and her memories of him. 
She inhabits the negative space with her despair. Why should we mourn? Isn't this the history we want? One in which we survive? The first time I read her poems, I assumed that she sliced her brother out of the photos herself. I thought she didn't want outsiders to be privy to his body. No, years ago, Wynn told an interviewer that her brother, in a fit of anger, carved himself from all of the family photos hanging in the hallway of their childhood home. Afterward, he carefully slid the photos back into their frames. They foreshadowed his death, and after his death, the missing shards in the frames wounded me deeply, she said in an interview. I avoided walking down that hall. I avoided returning to the house. When I learned this, her grief crept into me. I avoided walking down the hall. I avoided returning to the house. Why head down a hall of memories if it lead, leads to a perpetual reminder of death? I felt as though Wynne, with her poetry, had inhabited the void that her brother had left behind the way I now inhabit the one created by my mother. For many years, I could not look at photos of my mother. I wrapped the one from Steph in a scarf and tucked it into my bedroom closet underneath a box of clothes I no longer wore. The way I endured grief was to think only of the after and not the before. As a kid, I was certain that the images we had of our dead relatives were taken in caskets. A photographer pried open the deceased's eyes and held them there with double-sided tape. The cameras clicked, the dead person cartoonishly wide-eyed, mouth gaping. I couldn't conceive of the idea that these photos were taken in some version of the past when the subject was alive. Looking at these ancestral photos gave me a whole body chill, like I had come across a dead animal. One of our parakeets sprawled at the bottom of the cage, a fish floating at the top of its tank at the pet store. Uncanny, a small fright pulsing, my body retracting. Two years after her brother's passing, Wynne decided to tackle with words the empty spaces that her brother left behind in those photos. She said that in her work, she was trying to mourn, not exorcise. When I first read this, I was startled by how much this resonated. I have never wanted to exorcise you. I am too attached. My inclination is to preserve you, to taxidermy you like you wanted. But mommy, Grief is a container of contradictions. I want to expel something, though I do not know what. I want to rid myself of this heaviness just as much as I want to keep your ghosts. Writing about you is a strange act itself. I'm perhaps afraid of it, or at least I dread it. Yet I feel compelled to write you into being. I am hopeful though. I spin you out of myself and into something else. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you, Kat. <laughs> Um, and I want to ask you about how you spin yourself, uh, spin you out of yourself. And but before I do, uh, I wanted to just mention to the audience that later in the program, we're going to be doing an audience Q&A. So we would love for you to add any of your questions at any time during our conversation with Kat in the chat, because there might be something that comes up as she's talking that you uh, want to make note of. So please go ahead, feel free to do that. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I, I just, you know, had this um, almost this envy of how you've been able to share with this, the world this very rich portrait of your parents as the funny, imperfect, uh, complex people that they are. I think immigrant parents can often be portrayed as being strict, withholding, like stoic. <laughs> and um, one dimensional, clearly yeah. um, your parents are not, even if like, you know, to the outside world, they just are immigrants with accent, accented English. But I, I just thought it was such a tribute uh, that we got to know um, your parents as um, you know them. And I want to start with your mom, uh, you know, because ostensibly this book is about her, but as we um, watch the chapters unfold, it's much more than about her, but she is uh, the, the person who kind of moors the book and she's this very open, playful, loving woman. And she's so proud of her three girls. That really got me how, you know, um, proud of all three of you she was. And there's just too many good anecdotes about her, uh, but, you know, things that stuck out uh, to me is that she would put out birthday notices in the town newspaper <laughs> about you. Um, my mom has kind of done that kind of thing. I, I could, I, I um, that really resonated with me at the time I was very embarrassed, but it's because she was trying to 
show how proud she was. Um, yeah, she, it's so sweet too. It's just such an act of claiming this as your child and also um, very warm and surprising. Yeah, well, so I'm just wondering when you picture her, because we just catch her at so many moments throughout the book, when you think of your mom and she flashes up in your mind, what is she doing? Um, what memory pick, uh, comes up for you of her? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. I love it. Um, my mom is probably right now in my memory, if I'm trying to picture her right now, doing something really mischievous, probably doing something to be a little bit funny and uh, self-deprecating, maybe hiding and making a funny face. It calls to mind um, one of the narrative structures that I put into seeing ghosts, which is so much about my mom and so much about ghosts. Um, and it's basically springs from this joke that my mom made when I was nine years old. And this was before my mother knew that um, she was terminally ill with cancer and uh, trying to play off of my fear of dead things, basically. And I remember we were sitting in the family room of our house and my mom was eating sunflower seeds and I was watching TV or something like that. And my mom turned to me and said, when I die, I want you to get me stuffed and put in your future apartment. <laughs> and that's such a macabre thing, messed up thing in a lot of different ways to say to your child, but she was completely joking and that was exactly her sense of humor. But for years afterward, it made me think of her in that way, um, sort of as this taxidermic uh, weekend at Bernie's figure that um, was a little bit creepy and, uh, you know, funny. Um, but, you know, as a child, I thought it was terrifying, um, especially because in Chinese culture and a lot of East Asian cultures, there's that idea of ancestor worship, where if you don't appease the dead, then they, their spirits are going to be restless. And I really took that to heart as a kid, but as a writer, I saw it as a really interesting storytelling device. And I'll let the reader decide if the ghosts are real or if they're metaphors. <laughs> Yeah, your mom talking about being kind of the staff, stuffed mannequin in your apartment. It's 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 interesting how that kind of there's like a callback to it later on in the book. And I want to ask you about that and just um, the recurring theme of taxidermy and preservation. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I wanted to also, um, you know, just uh, ask you um, or just talk about your ask you about your parents' origins. And, you know, by the time we meet her or um, when we start the book, she's like, this total boss lady who's come to the States and has like mastered English and has like had two careers. And her Chinese name is uh, in Cantonese is, is it Bom Wei? Bom, Bom Wei. Wei, yeah. Bom Wei. And, um, but her coworkers know her as Florence. And uh, I, I just wonder how, I'm always so fascinated my my friend's parents, how they ended up in the case of your mom in suburban Connecticut, because her, her story starts uh, decades earlier in China. Yeah. So my mother was the youngest child in her in her family, and she grew up in a village near Guangzhou. And then eventually, like a lot of um, people who grew up in China in that era around the you know 50s, 60s, moved to Hong Kong, where she then eventually followed one of her siblings, her older sister, to Connecticut. Her sister was getting married to um, another uh, person from China who had settled and made a life in America with his family. And basically my grandfather's idea was that my yima, my, my aunt, would essentially slowly bring over the rest of the family. And so that's how they wound up in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where my mother convinced her dad to let her go to college and he insisted that she study to be a phlebotomist because that was a sciencey job and he'd always wanted to be a doctor, but because of um, the political climate in China had never really been able to get that level of education. And, um, you know, my mother <laughs> wound up working her way from one career, as you mentioned, to another and always instilled in my sisters and me this sort of really um, defined idea of success, which I think a lot of children of immigrants, you know, hear a lot about where you have to achieve. Um, but I think that came from a lot of family pressure and a lot of uh, pressure from her parents that she just needed to prove to them that she could make it on her own without their help. 
Mm -hmm. And that she uh, also had to deal with comparisons of her three daughters to her brother's sons yes. uh, by their father. Um, but she was just like, uh, like, you know, thought you guys were the most adorable, smartest and um, put together young women. And that was, um, that was amazing. And she, you had her as a role model. And uh, I, you know, I, your dad was also very accomplished. He went to MIT. And um, what I thought was interesting about how um, they met is that a lot of immigrant parents, they meet in the home country, old country, and they immigrate together. But your parents actually met at a swap meet in, I think it was Manchester, Connecticut. <laughs> oh, swap meet. Is that what they call oh, sorry, it? Not a swap meet. I'm sorry. A tag sale. Oh, I was like, well, because I know that they're called different things in different no, parts no, no, of the no. country. I was like, oh my gosh, wow, LA. <laughs> um, yeah, tag sale. Yes. A tag sale in Manchester, Connecticut. And um, my father was there because uh, a friend was leaving town and trying to sell his stuff. And my mother was there because a mutual friend had said, hey, maybe you should come. And it was interesting because, you know, we're as as children, I think children are often very curious about their parents' origin stories, how they got together, what is the mythology behind our family? What drew our parents together and, and why, why, why did this happen? Um, and so as a kid, I was always really interested in this story and I loved hearing my mom tell it because, um, you know, it was so interesting. Just, we met so serendipitously at a tag sale. And um, I'd never really heard my dad tell his side of the story. And so it was really interesting because when I was reporting out this book, it required so many interviews of my sisters, my father, other family members, because I just, you know, couldn't talk to my mom. I couldn't interview her. And she was just this uncertain and unknown entity. And so I remember asking my dad all of these questions like, what do you remember about her? And he would say, I don't know, I don't remember. And I'd say, do you remember why you were there? And he'd say, I don't know, I don't remember. And it just became this big theme where I would ask like, what drew you to her? Who spoke to who first? Do you remember what you even said if you were introduced or if you just noticed her? And I kept getting back, I don't know, I don't know as an answer. And it was so striking because was it to me, you know, as somebody who's always seen this distance between my father and me, was this because, you know, he didn't want to share or he simply couldn't remember? And so that line of questioning becomes this narrative in the book where I thought it was really important to have that included, the process, and to show how sometimes the answers that we receive are in what's not spoken. Mm -hmm. And um, Kat, I know you uh, first and foremost as a reporter, and I know you must have had some tough interview subjects, but your dad, oh my gosh, come on, he is, um, <laughs> he is a tough nut to crack. And as you said, you would just um, go, you were very persistent in your questioning. I could tell um, from your retelling of it, uh, but really maybe there is no one else who can better shut down an interview than a parent. And just like, you don't respect me, you don't know, you don't understand. And so many times he was evasive or vague. And I feel like a lot of what I was able to learn about him in your book is how the world interacted with him or how he, or, or vice versa, and your very acute observations of that. But, you know, can you talk about, I mean, it sounds like you were just um, kind of, I don't know if the word is eroded, but you just like your dad, uh, you know, got to hand it to him. You know, some families are like circle the wagons. Don't, don't talk about our family, but your dad, I mean, as much as he withheld, he also gave you a lot too. Yeah, right? he did. I mean, I thought it was so important to, even before I started the process of writing this book um, or before I even sold it in 2018, um, I talked, I talked to my family members and my sisters and my dad and, and said, are you okay with this? And they said, yes, and I hope that they understood what this process would entail, but they became really pivotal parts of writing this book. I mean, and it wasn't always easy having to interview them, and I'm sure it wasn't easy for them having to answer these questions over and over and over again. But in a way, I think, you know, it forced my father and I to have to have a lot of conversations that we might not have had in other situations. And we talked so frequently over FaceTime, over email, over the phone. And I had the chance to ask him all of these difficult questions. Yeah, I mean, after your, your mother died, you and your dad actually had so much time together, but 
uh, it seemed like during your high school years when you were you know, grappling with your, your mom's absence that sometimes everything you wanted to do was just to get away from the house. And it, it sounds like this, this project, this book actually um, you know, got you to know your dad or got closer to him, would you say? I think that in the act of writing about someone, um, especially, you know, my agent described this book as almost like this secret long profile of my father, where you think it's about my mother, but so much of it is about my father um, and how complicated he is. And I mean, I don't know if it brought me closer to him, if that's the word I would use, but I think it, it made me really have to understand him and try and think about the world from his point of view in order to tell him with depth and with context and to sort of illuminate the, the circumstances of his life that I didn't have answers to as a kid. Yeah, I, you know, we've been talking about how humorous and funny your mom and Rye, your mom is. And I assume, and I think you also gathered that you got a lot of your personality from her and her just um, it, you know, to her, she likes awkward situations, macabre <laughs> sense of humor, but I also think your dad is, is funny as well. And just, um, it, that, that came out kind of in unexpected times, like when you guys were fixing, I think, um, a, uh, some food for a neighbor whose family had deceased and there were some insects or something that had fallen into the ingredients. Am I getting this right? Yes. No, that's completely right. Yeah. And that he made a joke about, well, that's protein. And <laughs> I thought, okay, okay, that's true. A lot of people do eat that for protein. But, um, you know, you were a little bit, a few minutes ago, you were talking about how we are always trying to learn more about our parents because we see them, you know, their interactions are always with us in it. Our memories are with us in it. And, um, you know, you, you talk about your parents' marriage and you, you seem to try to investigate it in the book, but it seems like at times you're a little mystified um, by their relationship. I mean, they're so different uh, in just in personalities. Your dad was moodier, more restless, and your mom um, like uh, was so open and effervescent. Um, and has it actually kind of um, helped to inform how you understand relationships and how people coexist? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I think in the process of reporting out this book, I I would find documents, you know, I would find like letters from my, my parents to each other or cards that were so sweet. And it was unearthing these artifacts that really, you know, gave depth to the life that they had built together, where um, one thing that I go into a lot in, in the book is how my father holds on to everything. And um, he, he tends to hoard belongings and, um, that in a, in a way was a, a really strangely surprising helpful thing for a journalist and a memoirist because our house was full of so many artifacts of my mother and the leftovers of her relationship with us that I think showed so much of what she was like as a mother, but also my father's, in a way, his preservation of her by not wanting to get rid of a lot of that. And um, it taught me a lot about how the ways we hold on to memories and the ways that we hold on to people are so unique to each of us. But um, it, it just, it showed me, it just taught me so much writing this book in general about the ways, you know, the people we love are always with us in some degrees and our relationships with them continue even when they're not here with us not to get too not to get too existential but that's truly what this book taught me and I found it really beautiful this book also had a lot of striking parallels and you know that came out about your life and your parents life and just one thing I wondered if this drew your parents together was that both of them actually lost a parent very young in life and um and this was you know repeated in your own life and in your sister's lives, such a, a poignant um, like connection that you all had. And I wondered, were you still pretty young when you realized this? Uh, I mean, I also noticed that you have you have two older, older sisters, Steph and is it Caroline or Caroline? Caroline? Caroline, yeah. Who stepped in to mother you, albeit from afar, the way your mother's older sister did, you know, and um, had to step into that role. 
those are really, I'm so glad you picked up on those parallels because those parallels are sort of what helped me shape the book. And as a child, I, you know, I don't think I thought of my parents as being motherless or fatherless because I mean, I just only saw them as my parents and I, I never was able to consider their histories. I always understood that I didn't really have grandparents growing up. I mean, I had my my maternal grandfather, my Gong Gong, um, until you know he passed when I was young. But the the origin of my my parents was always this big cloudy mystery to me. And writing this book and seeing the parallels, it was really interesting because the the deaths that my parents experienced when they were fairly young, you know, teenagers or adults. Um, or, or children, that kind of helped ground the book because it, it really gave me the question of what do we owe? So going back to the idea in, um, you know, Chinese culture, East Asian culture of filial duty and so much ancestor worship, which I know probably Josie you're familiar with, um, it really, it helped me center that question of what do we owe? So what do we owe our parents? Um, in life or in death, um, or what do we owe our ancestors? What do we owe ourselves or our senses of home or our country? And um, that really helped me trace those similarities between me and my father or me and my mother, where, um, or my sisters and me, where one of the through lines throughout the book has to do with the remains of loved ones. Um, and one of my mother's last requests before she passed was for my sisters and me to have um, the remains of my baby brother who died two hours after birth before I was born to have his remains cremated and reburied with her in another cemetery in Connecticut. And, you know, for many years, this was something that my sisters and I just simply didn't do um, or couldn't do because of loss and grief and those feelings. And um, I realized pretty late, late in the game and through writing this book that my father also had a similar, you know, question and a similar duty he felt obligated to fulfill, which was to reunite his parents where, as you mentioned, Josie, his father was, you know, one of many thousands of uh, men to leave the Pearl River Delta area in China to live and work in Havana, Cuba. And my grandfather ended up dying there. And the questions of where he was buried or where his bones were was always a mystery to my family. Um, and because of you know the political climate, my family, once we became American citizens, could not go to Cuba um, to, to look. And so it was only in recent years where my father became really taken with this idea of looking for his father's remains to reunite them with his mother as she'd requested. I just spotted another parallel in the same way you were um, trying to hunt down your family's history. Your dad was doing that too. Mm -hmm. He wanted answers in this, I, you know, not trying to say that you get it from him, but I mean that, you know, the fact after your mother, your mother passed away, he, um, against the advice of her siblings, her family wanted an autopsy. He wanted to know. Yeah. Um, and so he's on a quest for, for answers too. Um, I, I don't want to monopolize you. So I just also want to reiterate to folks that, you know, if you have any questions for Kat, uh, just about her story, her family, her process, um, go ahead and just drop some questions um, in the chat. Um, Kat, like, Pretty early in the book, uh, I, I, I checked it was about a third of the way. You know, we we are with you when you lose your mom, and it, it's very it's <clears throat> heart wrenching because we've got to care about her and know about her. And um, but you know, like um, some pages in, you're in the hospital room in New York at age 13. I was just thinking about 13 year old um, Cat having to uh, have not knowing she was having her last conversation with her mom. Um, but even after you share this very tough experience of seeing her for um, the last time, you know, she she doesn't leave us because she is this recurring, um, you know, presence throughout the book. And I imagine that's how life has been for you um, in, you know, the last 20 year or plus years that she's been gone. And it sounds like, you know, based on the anecdote she you were telling about how she wanted to be um, taxidermied and sitting in your apartment, that, that that's, she would have wanted to be in your life in some way. And, um, you know, as we were saying earlier, taxidermy comes up again um, in the book and also explains the cover of the fish on, um, yes. 
uh, with the the eyes axed out because honestly, Kat, I was kind of, um, you know, I was very intrigued by the cover because seeing ghosts, I was like, what's up with that fish? But it, you know, once you read the book, it all comes together. Can you tell us more about the fish uh, yes. and, and the story behind it? So there is this big, big theme of taxidermy, as we've mentioned. Um, and the, the story sort of brings us into my college years where I returned home from um, the University of Washington in Seattle, where I went to school. And I, and I went back to my dad's house in Connecticut. And I went downstairs to the basement while we were cooking together. And I discovered that he had tried to taxidermy a sea bass himself or a striped bass himself. Um, he'd gone on a deep sea fishing trip with one of my sisters for Father's Day. And he'd gotten so seasick, but um, one of the things that he wanted was to keep one of the fish whole because the uh, captain of the charter boat had been talking about these taxidermy services. And so my father being you know, very proactive and always scrappy wanted to do it himself because he didn't want to pay the couple hundred dollars or so, or maybe more. Um, and so discovering this fish was a fascinating and, um, uh, grotesque and strange experience, as you could imagine. But as a writer thinking back on it, I found it to be such an interesting metaphor for the way he grieves and holds on to, um, you know, loss or objects and in the relationship that he has to, to trying to make things permanent. Because, um, so I was also reading this book called The Breathless Zoo by this writer and um, sort of, uh, academic named Rachel Poliquin. And the Breathless Zoo is, is this his social history of taxidermy. And what it's what's really interesting about, you know, what Rachel Poliquin writes in it is the idea that taxidermy serves as a way to build this souvenir or something that we are nostalgic for. And um, it was really interesting because, you know, it reminded me of how when we taxidermy something, we're trying to create this very, um, you know, like the perfect image of whatever was once living. Um, and we're trying to shape this animal or this fish into something similar to when it was alive, which of course is impossible. And for my father, that was so difficult because he couldn't capture the essence of this fish because, you know, he wasn't a professional. And it really also made me think of this idea, not to be like, not to be too rambly, but it made me think of this idea in Asian American studies or in um, American studies more generally called racial melancholia, which is um, a term that a few Asian American scholars, David Eng, Shin Hee Han, and Anne Anlin Chang came up with. And they were expanding on this idea that Sigmund Freud had when he wrote about mourning and melancholy, where mourning has an end in sight, but melancholy, the person who is you know, grieving something, knows they have lost something, but they don't know what, maybe. And it's almost pathological. And when I found this fish, I, I immediately thought of, well, I didn't immediately, but reflecting on it, I thought of these ideas of taxidermy and also racial melancholia, because it just seemed to be so symbolic of what my family had been going through. Yeah. And um, yeah, I've read a little bit about racial melancholia, and I I think that was def definitely something that imbued our family. And I think that's what struck me about your mom, um, you know, being in this foreign adopted country, uh, you know, dealing with all the things that cause racial melancholia, being an immigrant and being viewed as an outsider and just her being able to um, exhibit joy and, and yes. pass that joy on and, and, and uh, you know, have this legacy of um, these three three daughters who are so close and um, obviously enjoy and laugh um, within each other's company. Um, but uh, I think, um, oh, okay, just a few more minutes actually before we go to questions, but I wanted to, um, you know, just ask you too about, uh, um, you know, you were talking about your gong gong and how, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of stories there too. Um, and as difficult as it was sometimes to get the stories out of your dad, there it was sometimes even harder to learn about what had happened in, in China generations earlier. And uh, when you would press folks, you'd have to, you, you seem very cognizant of the fact that it might trigger something. So you were very uh, respectful of how they may be feeling emotionally. But I 
I, I nodded when I read the passage about your Gong Gong and his parents because there's it's it's hazy. The history is hazy, and that's how um, I have my sister and I when we try to piece together what happened in our families from Taiwan, what happened in you know just a generation or two ago. It's we don't know. It's like this, yeah. Hunt. And I don't know. It's just this feeling that how do you feel about that? Not not ever really being able to know. It's almost the ineffable, like what happened? Completely, before? yeah. I think, so one way I tried to write about it was um, describing how the stories that my family would tell about my Gong Gong or, you know, their family back in China would always be told in this passive voice where things were happening to them, where, you know, um, never, they were never sort of the active participants where um, it just, it seemed as though, events were falling out of the sky and, and they had, you know, very little agency or um, they would never say that, for example, the communists pushed us out. Um, it was always like, we just, we were, we were, uh, we were made to leave our home. Um, and so you really, it really taught me to have to read between the lines and also keep pushing for these, these questions. And I will share something, which is, um, one of the people who I write about interviewing is my my Kofu, my one of my uncles, my mother's brother, who um, he was a helpful you know participant in this story and, and revealed some emotional things. But the point of the story is that actually last year while I was writing this book, he actually passed away suddenly, and um, it was really hard to reconcile that as I was writing this book, but also as I was speaking to his sons about, you know, just our family in general, and, and we were all mourning together. One of them revealed that while he had been going through his father's stuff, my Kofu's stuff, he discovered the presence of um, another potential, like my, that my grandfather had another sibling that no one had talked about. And it was so fascinating to me how I'd never known this growing up. And it was only through looking through records after somebody had passed that we'd been able to discover that my grandfather had a sister that had been excommunicated by the family because she was a communist. Um, and so that was really, that was really interesting. And um, not being able to ask my mother questions about this was hard and, and you know, asking other people about it also proved difficult too. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you plan on doing more nonfiction, but it sounds like there's another, your family is just like <laughs> mine. Um, you know, both your parents are, were, are fluent, were fluent in English, and you know some Cantonese, but uh, do you think that your experience on this journey, um, digging into your family's past and and just your relation and, and um, delving into your relationships, would that have been any different if, you know, you spoke the native tongue of, you know, Cantonese. Oh my gosh. I'm so, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, not being able to build up the ease with certain relatives um, and have, you know, the language to ask a very nuanced question and to convey it with emotion and to convey it with um, sort of subtlety, you know, uh, and to, because oftentimes in interviews, so much of the most wonderful essence of what you get is not always by asking a direct question, but just by making a conversation happen. And so to not really be able to do that fluently or to have to use um, a family member who could translate where you're always losing something in translation was, was really interesting. And, and I think in general, what this taught me about interviewing is that it is such an intimate act where I've interviewed so many people as a journalist and I've, you know, of course, tried to always be sensitive, but there's always such a vulnerability when someone opens up to you and they give something to you to potentially use. They're, they're giving themselves away, in a sense, and that's information that they'll never be able to take back. And so it just makes you so aware of how hard it is for certain people to share stories. Um, yeah, and it, it made me realize how interviewing is such a gift. Yeah, no, I mean, you're yeah, making me realize how lucky we are to be doing what we're doing. <laughs> um, I, yeah, it, um, well, I want to let other folks have a chance to ask questions. And we already have some audience questions here that uh, I have, of course, many, but, I, but these are really great ones, too. Um, from Catherine Singer, she asks, 
what was your process of writing the story, the scenes bounce around time-wise? Is there a uh, deep meaning to that? Yes, so I really wanted the memories and these scenes to sort of work similar to grief, um, where you have these flashes of memories that can be painful or so visceral or wonderful or joyous. And a lot of the ways that we think about our loved ones and a lot of the ways our, our past surfaces. Um, and I wrote this by uh, writing first the most visceral memories that came and also trying to make sure that every single one of those scenes somehow in some way address the questions of what do we owe or who is my family? Um, you know, your book has, uh, you know, you just described some heavy themes, but it has light and levity, but uh, you knew you were gonna be um, sitting with a lot of heavy, heavy memories right in this book and missing your mom. How do you know, how did you know you wanted to do this? And, and when mm. did you know? Oh, this is a surprisingly hard question to answer because I feel as though this has been something I've always wanted to do in some way or always have been trying to do, where I think I've always been obsessed with these questions of what loss really means, um, even as a child after my mother passed, where writing, you know, had always been how I made sense of the world and I was always trying to write about what was happening to my family, even as a kid. Um, of course, I didn't really think I would write this book, but in college I would, you know, I took so many Asian American studies classes. I, I thought that I could be a journalist and tell stories of immigrants and um, Asian Americans. And um, I was also writing this fictionalized version of what would become this book probably. Well, not exactly, but, um, and I just realized that, you know, this was something that I felt I'd always been building toward. Um, figuring out how to tell this story, whether it was through my reporting or um, through my own personal writing. Uh, one thing um, is to, I, I think it seems, seems like at a young age, you were already journaling um, because I think about like, you know, the passages about your mom, they were all from memories that you collected before age 13, but they're so vivid. Where, did you start journaling before even age 13? Yes, I did actually. And you know, I mean, a lot of times those those entries would just be like, I played soccer today and then would get so distracted and then would come back like four hours later and, and time stamp it. But I did. And um, I I think I was pretty lucky in that I've always been sort of a, a detailer of what happens. <laughs> and um, also photographs really helped in jogging memory, photographs and interviewing people. And the way I remember things, I was just by the image that comes to my mind. And so a lot of these, I was describing a scene or this image, and then I would go back and I would actually find the photo and that would be almost like a miracle. Did the photos ever not match up with how you remembered things? Oh, sometimes like little details, yes. Or, um, you know, instead of it being a cousin, I'd realize, oh, that wasn't a cousin. That was like, that was a family friend. Um, but so then I would, you know, change it or revise it. But um, it was really interesting how how sharp a lot of those situations were. Yeah, and it was also interesting to see with the passage of time. I could tell the passage of time in your story because how you would interview folks would change. Like you would sometimes have your dad on video, or I think at one point you had your dad with a Marantz. Yeah. <laughs> um, was when you were probably working for public radio station by that point or NPR. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, good, good detail to pick up on. Great plus reader um, of your book. So uh, another question from um, an audience member, uh, Becca Stumi said she had a very emotional response to this book as a reader. So I imagine it was quite an intense process for Kat. Were there any ways you were able to take care of your emotional mental health while writing? Is that even possible? <laughs> <laughs> well, I finished writing and editing this book last year during the start of the pandemic. So that was a hard, that was a hard one. Um, I, you know, I, I gave myself so much time. Um, I, I, you know, wound up getting extensions for this book because it was so hard to write, but also because a lot of, a lot of what was happening toward the end was unfolding in real time too. Um, like my father and his last trip to Cuba happened in 2019. And so that changed the outcome of the story. And, you know, it just, it required so much grace and empathy for 
my family and myself and being very gentle that this story needed to take time in order to tell it well. Um, but as far as self-care, yeah, a lot of binge watching Netflix, a lot of, you know, therapy, therapy is great and calling up friends when I need it and trying to write through whatever I was feeling. And did you have to be disciplined? Did you treat it like a job? Because it seems like such a delicate process. I don't know if it's something where you can just like sit down like fixed hour every day and just um, write, write, write. Cause sometimes that's what they say, right? I hear from my academic friends who like set a timer, like an egg timer and you know, just even if they write for a few minutes, it's something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think trying to be disciplined was always the goal. Um, and I, I'm in general, I find it really hard to follow schedules because I like to stay up late at night. But um, I Same. really wanted to write this. And so I would just find myself in these huge bursts where I just wouldn't sleep for, for days. And it would just be so such an intense process. Um, and then just making sure that I was trying to write every single day or at least four days a week or five days a week and devoting certain days to research or just devoting certain days to letting myself take really long walks to process what was happening in the world or what I had just written about was also really important. Um, yeah, and as you were saying, uh, the story was still evolving as you were in the middle of it, uh, still writing. And uh, from Betsy, uh, another person who's listening in, how did your family react to your telling of family secrets? Oh, I mean, you know, they were the ones who shared the family secrets with me because I interviewed them throughout the book so much. And so whatever, you know, whatever the context of like, whatever is in this book is things that they were willing to share. And so um, that was sort of like this built-in negotiation throughout the reporting process. Uh, and your sisters, I, you know, they are a little bit more on the periphery than your parents, but I feel like I also got to know them uh, somewhat uh, and they, they just seem awesome. Um, Caroline, it, it, she's still see, in Seattle and- She's in California now. She's yeah. in California. And then your other sister, Steph, is in, um, uh, is, is a physician, right? A gerontologist or? Yeah, a geriatrician in New York, yeah. Oh, okay. And and you guys still take your family vacations, it sounds like, um, along up and down the East Coast with your dad. And yeah. I mean, a lot, lot has changed. I mean, since, I mean, you writing this book, has it changed the dynamic at all in your family? Do you, do you have, have you mined everything? Do you know everything about your family? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there's always more secrets to unearth. Um, I don't think I'm going to be writing another book. Uh, I think one, one memoir is enough for me, but, um, I mean, has it changed us? I think it's made us closer and more attuned. Like we have this shared history that we all know sort of about where one of my sisters, Caroline, after she read the book, kept saying like, you know, and I, I gave each of them early copies to read early drafts before it was even published or done. And my sister Caroline said, like, now we have this archive and now I know so much, or I didn't know that before. And so to have this shared history, but also to have a shared narrative is, is really for me lovely. And I think, it, you know, of course my family members feel vulnerable because who wouldn't, but um, I think it's, I hope it's made us closer. Yeah, you're, I, I keep on going back to this because I just can't fathom my dad being cool with it. But like <laughs> you were so honest about how like PO'd you were at your dad during high school years and, and just, you know, you, you guys said some pretty rough things to one another um, and that, you know, uh, that, that he, I mean, he just, uh, he, when he's obviously read your book and how does, has he said about, has he said anything about how, it, how it's like to hear these? Cause I imagine you, you have a lot of these things that are in your book. You haven't maybe said in that particular way to him, to his face. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting because so he read an early copy of the book and like my dad is such a matter of fact person. And so I assumed and kind of had the sense that he would be very matter of fact too, after he read it. But um, I remember giving it to him, giving a copy to him, um, that was, you know, like the final draft of the manuscript where basically things could still be changed. And I wanted him to read this early draft so that he would be prepared, but also if anything was just egregiously wrong or upsetting, he could tell me. And um, he 
he read the book, I think really fast actually, and then sent me this email that said book review. <laughs> and I clicked on it and it was just a numbered list of page numbers and tiny things that um, he had little corrections to. Like the kitchen counter is uh, for mica, not linoleum. Or um, I was actually in the car in this instance too. Or, um, you know, like the year was like this year instead of that year. And so he read it very closely. And that was his way, I think, of showing that he cared. And at the end, he wrote, um, good luck with the book. Love, Daddy. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you had your own like built-in fact checker. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we were, you know, was saying earlier, this, this book was ostensibly about your mom, but really I felt it was as much about your relationship with your dad because uh, he, what became a single parent um, in, at a, when you were at a very young age in high school. And I just, uh, you know, I, he, he's a, he's a tough guy, but um, I, I, I could tell to live with, but I just found little, there was little ways he showed that he loved you um, by making cake for you and like, you know, going on a road trip with you when you went to the University of Washington for college. Yeah. yeah. And little ways you look out for him, you know, saying drink more water, like take care of yourself. And um, I don't know. I, I just, uh, uh, and, and, and there, you use this very interesting technique um, in your book where throughout the book, you directly address your mother, but then towards the end, um, it, you know, there's like a, a chapter where you said, where you said, daddy, and mm -hmm. um, why did you decide to, to suddenly address him at the end? Yeah, that's a really good observation. I think that was so intentional um, because I wanted, I wanted to make sure that my dad as um, this figure who is almost ghost-like, even though he is still around, could could come through. Um, and I wanted to indicate to the reader that this was a very intentional choice and that um, you know, so much of this book, I also feel as though was mourning my father to some degree or not, maybe not mourning, as, maybe that's not the right word, but um, anticipating, you know, the the ways in which we can't outrun mortality. And so I wanted this book to become this memorial to my mother, but also this memorial to my father. And so it was really important to imagine or to sort of refer to him as this ghost-like figure and to, to try and use this to, yeah. What I love about direct address is that it's so intimate, right? And often when you're speaking to a you, you're almost, trying to close the distance between you and, and the subject. And I really wanted to do that with this book. Yeah. This book was so much about your family, but as I was saying earlier, there was, I, I think the best memoirs is, memoirs are the ones that also make you think about your own family and um, how you relate to one another. And I know your book's been out for a few weeks now, and I imagine you've gotten quite a bit of response from readers who may have not lost their mothers, but may be dealing with other things in their families. I mean, it doesn't, sometimes it's not death that affects a relationship with a parent. Uh, there could be divorce, disease, um, you know, and uh, I'm wondering what kind of feedback have you, you heard mm. back from people so far? I love when people have really noticed the tiny details. I got a really lovely um, note from a reader who felt so seen by the use of Cantonese in the book, but also one of the references, um, which was, uh, there's a line somewhere um, about how um, most people who have Asian mothers know that um, cut fruit means love. And um, just the, that tiny, that tiny, tiny sentence, I think really resonated. And it was just so meaningful to have a reader who understood that reference and it hit home for them in such a specific way. And it was really visceral. Um, and it's been really meaningful too for people who you know don't share a similar cultural experience to see themselves in it or to um, love the ways in which the memories surface their own about their own you know, family. And that's been, that's been really like lovely as a writer. <laughs> Yeah, no, that um, cut fruit line resonates with me because I am now that Asian mother. Oh, <laughs> fruit and like you know when the kids are doing something else, I'm like jamming fruit in there or you know, 
Um, and actually like reading about your mom, she's kind of like the, the mom I aspire to be. There is this, I love the structure of your book because it's, it's not predictable at all. You have chapters that are just like a page long or a few pages, but one of them, there's an anecdote about, I think you guys going on a road trip to Acadia and, <laughs> Um, you guys stop off at a rest stop and you go ahead and tell, you can, you can yeah, tell. so we stopped off at a rest stop and my mother said to my sisters and me, oh, you got you girls go on ahead and go to the bathroom. And I went into a stall and I was only five years old and I was so certain I could go to the bathroom by myself. And little did we know that my mom, our mom had snuck into the bathroom with us and she had chosen the stall right next to mine. And while I was using the toilet, she (laughs) reached under the stall and grabbed my leg. Um, So yeah, she, she was always trying to pull pranks on us children. And of course that was terrifying as a child, but that was completely her sense of humor. Yeah, no, it was funny because like, I think you look reproachfully at her and she was like, Sorry, but that's I I that's the kind of mom I aspire to be. I <laughs> to terrify your children. Yeah, to terrorize children and have them remember me as being like a total goofball. Um, <laughs> so, but on on that note uh, about your mom, um, I just wanted to to thank you for for doing doing this chat with us and and thank everyone who's been on this call. Uh, for folks who haven't. Um, gotten a copy of Kat's book, uh, you can do so at our partner bookstore, uh, Skylight Books. And um, I don't know, Kat, do you have any anything else you want to say? Or No, uh, thank you so much, Josie. I love the reporting that you do for KPCC and Elias. It's, it's just so important. And the way you cover Asian Americans is so nuanced. And so I've really appreciated getting to share that with you here. <laughs> Thank you so much. I feel that way about, I mean, nuance is how I would describe your work as well. Thank you. So <laughs> um, thank you uh, also to Scripps and KPCC, LAS. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Have a good evening. Be safe. Be happy. Thank you all.